Before I get into the sermon this morning, we will acknowledge that today is Mother's Day, and we'd like to express appreciation and honor to each of the mothers present in our assembly today. And we encourage each of us, as we have opportunity, to express our love and appreciation to our mothers. For some of us, it will be in memory. For others, it will be in person. For others, it may be by some modern day communication to cover the distance. So we trust that today can be a good day for all mothers as we recognize their importance, their preciousness, and uh, uh, how, how much a part of our lives they are. I've tried to anticipate what you might think at first when you see that subject. I've thought of several possibilities. To some it will be familiar, to others not, maybe so much. But it will definitely raise some questions. It's um, part of a continuing effort to address subjects that are especially helpful during this particular period of time in our lives, in our church, and our church history as we press and push onward into the, the future. We have talked about self-testing. We have talked about the uh, believing, I believe, but help my unbelief. We all need that help. Last week, the gems of John 3.16. Today, I invite your uninvited attention to the old paths. Some questions that may come up is, I'm not sure what they are, would you please explain? Or I think I know what they are, but I'm not sure whether they apply to us or not in our Christian lives, in Christianity today. But I would suggest to you in the next few minutes, if you listen closely, we will discuss some things that will help all of those questions be answered and hopefully you can leave this assembly in addition to every other part of your worship today, being edified by the Word of God, feeling closer to God, feeling like you can live the Christian life in a better way, and understanding how important, how important old paths are to you as a, as a Christian. They have a, a home in Scripture. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, we don't often preach sermons from Jeremiah, but this one is found in the sixth chapter and in verse 16. When Jeremiah recorded, thus saith the Lord, you'll notice that's Jehovah, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Ooh, it ends in a rather sobering note there, doesn't it? It reminds us of the difficult work that Jeremiah did. Just briefly appreciate Jeremiah. As an Old Testament prophet, he lived just as the southern kingdom of Judah was coming down to captivity. It was his job to go into the people of God and try to get them to, re to change, to turn back to God and be faithful to him before it's too late, before those Babylonians come and carry you away into captivity, into that exile. So Jeremiah's work started before that first deportation in 606, which took Daniel. Jeremiah was there. In 597, when Ezekiel was taken, Jeremiah was there. In 586, when the Babylonians utterly destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple, Jeremiah was there. And I say that to give us appreciation into Jeremiah, the difficult work that he had, the suffering that he went through. This verse is a part of that effort that he made. So as we look at this, the, the, the old path is a part of Jeremiah's plea. So because of this, the expression comes to the forefront in our religious thinking, in our Bible knowledge. It causes us to have questions about the expression and, and its use to Judah, the kingdom of Judah in 600 BC. What did it mean for them? But 
This use in the Bible for Judah causes us to ask, what use does it have for us today? For Christianity. I want to pose a question in general. And to, to show what some might think. The old paths, are they obsolete? Or are they a pressing need? That's a good way to put that question because we are very conditioned as people in our culture today to think if something gets old, <laughs> if something is old, it's time to get rid of it. It's time to trade it in. Or sometimes if we still want to see it, we put it in a museum. <coughs> or if it's possible, we will update it. And so there are many ways that being old is not good. And so when it comes to old paths in the Bible, people say, well, that's obsolete. Let's get rid of them. Let's trade them in for newer paths. But I suggest, or are old paths compelling to the point where they're pressing upon us to walk in them, to follow them? So are they obsolete or are they a pressing need? We're going to answer that question, and I hope you can leave with the determination that you know the answer, you're confident of the answer, and you're determined to live your life consistent with the answer. To help us in a significant way, I have some Q&A. I think Q&A is a good way to get into some clarity, to clarify to give insight into some truth. And so I want us to ask and answer some questions that I think would be on our minds, would be rather common. And so our first question, exactly what does this expression refer to? What is meant in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16 by the expression old paths? Well, let's turn the page into Jeremiah chapter 7 where in verse 23, God is saying the very same thing, at least in principle, but using different language. And in this passage, he said, This thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. You will notice, and I'll help clarify it for us, in chapter 6, verse 16, he talked about the old paths. In chapter 7, verse 23, he used a parallel expression meaning exactly the same thing, the ways that I have commanded you. So when we look at what old paths is referring to then, it really becomes very clear in biblical explanation, letting the Bible explain itself without any human intervention or human opinion, that old paths is an expression in the Word of God that identifies what God has commanded. The ways that God wants us to walk, to follow, to, to obey His voice. There are paths that are charted by Him and are traveled by those who are His faithful. But another observation that we would make from especially Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. It is the old paths that the only good way is found. Now mark that down in your mind and your thinking. The reason I need to think and understand <laughs> what the, good, the, the old paths are is because it's only in them, it's only in those old paths that we can find the good way, the good way. God said the only place that you'll find the good way is in the old paths. So we have the answer to that. And so I have a, a, another question that I think is important, and that is, what did God expect? What's God's attitude toward the old paths? That's what should be paramount in our thinking, in our inquiry. I want to know what God thinks. Well, let's just look at the verse again. Let the verse speak for itself. Let's underline a part of it. In that expression, underline, 
there is an imperative that God issued. He said, ask for the old paths. In other words, one of the things that God expected was for his people to ask for them. Not to be repelled by them, not to throw them away, but to ask for them. Or as we have said in the second part of that expression, demand them. <laughs> We've got to have them. We absolutely demand to have the old paths. But there's a second underlining here. And God said, walk therein. So, in other words, I'm just to memorize them. I'm just to think about them. <laughs> or some good feeling relationship to them. No. God said that we are to walk in them. And what he meant by that is you take them, you live by them. You live your life according to what they teach. You go in the direction that they lead you. You do exactly what they want. And so... We're answering our question, aren't we? Can anyone say that the old paths are therefore obsolete? Something to be discarded, something to throw, be thrown away. The old paths for God's people were not that, but a pressing need. When God pressed upon them, you've got to ask for them. You've got to live by them. That was a pressing thing for them. So I have another question. Do we have old paths? Well, all of us Bible students would think that the old paths that Jeremiah was talking about or that God was talking about through Jeremiah were the Mosaical Law. The Mosaical Law had been given about 800 years before Jeremiah wrote that, so that's, that's pretty old. Moses was on Mount Sinai in 14 B.C. Jeremiah's writing about... 600 B.C., rounded numbers. So we're looking about the way the old paths are at this point in Bible history about 800 years old. That's pretty old. But those are not our old paths, are they? Our old paths are not the Mosaical law, the law of Moses. God has given us the Old Testament for a lot of good reasons, and those are declared in the New Testament, and we try to live up to those, studying and learning the Old Testament. But they're not the old paths that God has given for us today. So the question then continues to beg, do we have old paths? Let me ask that another way. We're asking, do we have ways that God has given us that are old? <laughs> I think we all know the answer to that question. And if that is so, then how have these old paths come to us? They're found in what God has spoken to us through his son Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament and in previous dispensation, he spoke through various ways, but now he speaks to us in his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. No argument, is there? That's how God speaks to us today, through Christ. The Apostle Paul called this teaching, that is the teaching that God has given us through Christ, the gospel of Christ. And that's something very familiar. Now keep in mind, what we're seeing here is a pattern of the identity of the teaching that we have today that we're trying to answer the question, do we have old paths? It is also called in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 8, uh, and it, 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 this is even from Jeremiah chapter 31, that's quoted in Hebrews chapter 8, a new covenant, or using another word, New Testament. And so just to note that these writings were completed by 96 AD. What we have in our hand that is called the New Testament, the Gospel of Christ, has been completed in its original authorship 
by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit 1,927 years ago. That's a lot older than what Jeremiah was talking about. That's pretty old. But the, then the question comes, and the reason why a lot of people are turning away from the old paths, because they're old. It's like that, that old man in, in Rick's lesson this morning, in that first lesson, that Yiddish yoke lower, uh, that truth was walking around. He said, I'm old. Nobody will pay attention to me. Everybody's throwing me away. <laughs> That's a good point in that lesson. Then the parable comes along. But the clarity of truth is never, never, if that's what God has given to us, is never obsolete and never to be thrown away. So the, the true mode of our serving God in the gospel of Christ, in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, in, in what we have in our teaching of Christ that is given to us is really old paths because it represents all the ways that God has commanded us through his son. This reminds us of the statement that Jesus made of himself in John chapter 14 and verse six. He personified this and made himself the person of that. I am this personified. I am that old path in person. It's in me as the personification. He said, I am the way, the, tr the life, the truth and the life, and no one cometh unto the Father but by me. So anyone that wants to come along and throw it away or attempt to change it, add to it, take away from it, or say that it's obsolete, we need some new stuff, we need some new teaching, we need something that's more appealing to this modern generation of people. Hey, <laughs> a lot of people are being influenced by that kind of thinking and being misled religiously by that kind of thinking, and that's why Many, many people in our world today, in the religious world, are being led astray by that very message of trying to convince them, you need something better. You need something new. You need something updated that's more effective in the modern era. Don't believe it. Don't be influenced by such teaching. Young people need to learn, hey, you're going to hear a lot of this. Your friends are going to influence you in a lot of ways to think that way about religion, about the Bible, about God. And you have to learn the truth, learn what the Bible teaches, and stand strong. And that's what these passages do to us and to our attention. But I'm going to follow this up by another question. What does God expect of you with your old paths? <laughs> well, I would suggest, and you might already, well, I'm already ahead of you on that one, Lynn. Okay, great. Because he expects the same thing of you today, May the 14th, 2023, that he did for the people of Judah with whom Jeremiah was working in 629 B.C. As expressed the way God put it, ask for the old paths and walk therein. So we would summarize that in application to us. Ask for them. Demand them. Uh, Any time that uh, people going to church, are going to, I'm going to listen to a religious teaching, I'm going to read, read a religious article. If that article or that teaching is trying to influence you, away and pull you away from something else and making something new more appealing to you then you've got to have the strength no i demand old paths i demand what god has given and it, it may not be popular with you it may not my friends may not like it 
but that's where I am in my relationship to God, in my strength spiritually, because I want to go to heaven. We not only are to ask for them or request and demand them, but we are to walk therein, make them your manner of life. And so again, we have the conclusion that is the answer to our question, the old paths for God's people today are not obsolete. We may have a tendency to think that anything old is, is obsolete. No, it's not. It's not past its use. It's not to be discarded. It's not to be replaced. Old paths are not obsolete. They're still very much the living word of God, still very much truth, still very much the way to heaven. And there is no substitute uh, for that. And so that's why we affirm today, if you don't get anything else, remember that from these principles, these old paths are a pressing need for me. They're a pressing need. Why are they pressing? Because the preacher said so? Not at all. Because God said so. God has put this pressure on you. <laughs> if you feel any pressure from old paths, it's God that has made it compelling and the right thing uh, for you to do. So what does God expect? Let's think about the word walk for just a moment, as we have suggested. He has not only taught us to ask for them, he has taught us to walk in them. But let's think about the word walk in the New Testament and realize that it refers to Christian conduct in God's way, called by him old paths. Well, in Romans chapter 6 and in verse 4, the Apostle Paul said that we were buried with Christ and raised with Christ, that we, that we might walk in newness of life. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 4, Paul is talking about the difference between those who walk after the flesh and those who walk after the spirit. Those who walk after the flesh are carnal and fleshly. But if we want to please God and to be friends with God, then we must walk after the Holy Spirit. That's an old path. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, come to the, that's the end of that paragraph there, that, that he talked about what God had prepared before for us. God afore prepared what? Good works. Just serving the Lord, serving other people that we might walk in them. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul starts that chapter with what seems to be an impossibility. Imitate God. Oh, who can imitate God? <laughs> well, we have to understand what he means. In that which is imitable, we can all imitate our Father and become like our Father in qualities that he intends for us to develop to be like him. And he talks about things in Ephesians chapter 5 that are a shame even to talk about. There are so many bad things being done in the world, even in the first century, that it was even a shame to talk about them. We don't even talk about that ugly, bad, dirty stuff that people do in serving Satan. Well, what are Christians to do? Walk as children, not of darkness, but of light of illumination, of shining forth the example and the teaching and the representation of the image of Christ. And so Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 is the verse in which that is found. So old paths for God's people today, not obsolete, <laughs> no way near obsolete, but a pressing need. So I have another section here I want to be as specific as we can and in the time that we have to be referenced. And that is, what are some of our old paths? Can you name some of them? 
when you're walking in that way, what, what would you call that? <laughs> this is not a, a, a challenge mentally, it's just for us to think about what we do in our lives that is like this. What are some of our old paths? The New Testament church. It's old. <laughs> it's been on the earth almost 2,000 years, short 10 years. It's an old path. The Lord built, bought his church with his own blood. He sent his apostles into all the world to preach it and to establish it in various cities. And he has con intended for that work to continue to this very day. But wait a minute. We live in a modern era. Let's change the Lord's church. Let's, let's develop another organization. Uh, when I say that, I'm reminded of something. Uh, maybe some of you have had a similar experience. But about two weeks ago or so, so Linda, Linda and I had an appointment with our attorney. We're working out a, not for the first time, but revising our will a little bit. This personal, we all do that, right? But this attorney, I, without naming anyone or naming his religious affiliation, we've known him for many years. He knows us, he knows who we are, where we are, and we know him. And every time we get together, we talk religion at some point. Two weeks ago was no exception. Sitting around this table with papers in front of us trying to work these things out, religion came up. And he, he, he wanted to share with us some things about the church that he's presently attending. Severely troubled, severely divided in this world today. And I don't mind naming that. You probably have read it in the news. It's the Methodist Church. They're being divided by moral problems today. The ruling hierarchy wants to compromise and accept lesbian, homosexual, gay marriage, transgenderism, in order to be more accepting to the public. Well, as we might expect, there's a lot of people in that religious organization that does not want to do that, that doesn't think that's right. But nevertheless, that's dividing the church. Well, what's going to happen? Well, where this particular attorney attends, they're not going to stand for that and this moral issue. But in order to remove themselves from that hierarchy, it's going to cost them thousands of dollars to be dismissed from that organization, to stand for what... And if we could go into that detail, it's not my purpose to go into that. I, we just simply ask him a question. I said, what about what the Bible teaches? <laughs> that hadn't even come up. But what the Bible teaches on these lesbian, gay, marriage, homosexual marriage, the, the transgenderism of this thing. Well, what does the Bible teach? Well, that wasn't a part of discussion yet. And he did not have an answer for that because it's not really a primary consideration, is it? For religious people like they're more concerned about maintaining the organization, the hierarchy, the doctrine, the denomination. But with these modern moral issues dividing people, it's becoming increasingly challenged. Well, that church is, what, about 500 years old, but that's not old enough. Old paths goes back to 33 A.D. when the Lord, and it's, it's, the, it's the intent, the goal, it should be the goal of every church, including this one to be that church in Acts the second chapter that was established that the Lord built. It's not our purpose to make a new one. It's not our purpose to make a new path. It's our purpose to stay on the old path and do what the Lord said to do. And that has to do with what we are, a church, the old path. 
I said, why, why do we seem so old fashioned sometimes? People ask, why are you seemingly staying what seems to us to be old fashioned? It's not being old fashioned. It's just simply staying with what God said and demanding old paths and walking therein. And we will do that from this day until Christ comes again, as long as we're alive. But also the Lord's plan of salvation. How many different plans, new paths are there out there for what to do to be saved? All we need is the old path to go into the New Testament and, and, and read and learn and understand what the Lord taught that I must do and that you must do to be saved. That's the old path. And that's what we call the plan of salvation, what the Lord plans for you to do in order to save your soul from going to hell. Well, what about God's moral standard? We've alluded to it in some ways. It affects a lot of different areas of life. But what about these issues? What about these things that we're hearing so much about that are going astray? What about the things that are, seem to be pulling our, our, our very country into, into lower levels of morality? What, what about, well, God's moral standard has been forgotten, has been neglected, has been thrown away, and new standards by a lot of people. So where do we fit as Christians? We fit into that picture today on this day in this current modern era by standing for and demanding and walking in the old paths. But, but that's old fact. Well, no, no, let's don't use that word. It's God's standard. It's what God said is pure. It's what God said that I have to do to live my life according to his standard of righteousness. How many different ways have man developed to worship? Well, there are many, just like in other issues. But what the New Testament teaches is that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must, must worship in spirit and truth. Lord said that in John chapter 4. So that's the old path, is worship in truth. What if it's not in the Bible? That's not in the old path. It's not in truth. If people have devised something new and things that the Word of God doesn't even teach, then they have left the old path and developed new paths that must be ignored. So our worship is precious, every part of it because each part of it has been given by God. And we walk in that, we demand that. There are some things about that that according to judgment, matters of judgment, Carl did one this morning that I thought was good. He had to stand up for prayer. He said that was different and that, that, that's, that's good. Uh, that's, well, that's not violating any matter of scripture, that's a matter of judgment that facilitates makes expedient our worship. But marriage as God instituted it, you know I would mention that at some point. From the sixth day of creation, God instituted one man, one woman, be united together in marriage. The Lord in Matthew chapter 19, said, have you not heard from the beginning? The Lord in his teaching, instituted into his teaching, which is our old paths, what God said at the beginning, that he made them male and female and intended for them to be joined together in marriage. And that what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So marriage as instituted is the oldest institution upon the face of the earth on the sixth day that God created the universe. That's an old path. But that's the one the Lord brought for you into the new covenant, the new testament. 
and then our homes. How much attention we need to give our homes in this day in which our homes are being attacked from a lot of different angles, from different sources of, of evil trying to destroy our homes, trying to destroy marriages, and the influences that come from education of our kids, that come from the, the, the woke uh, influence that we hear and we talk about once in a while, then our homes need to be maintained and ordered around Christ. And I would encourage each of us to order our homes around Christ. Husbands, be a good husband around Christ. Be a good father around Christ. Wives, be a good wife around Christ. Be a good mother around Christ as you even celebrate this day. It's the blessing that you have. And the kids uh, in that home need to be ordered around him and be brought up in the nurture and admonition uh, of the Lord. None of that is obsolete. What did God promise? Well, let's remind us of these promises. Jeremiah 6, ask for the old paths and walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. Anything in which God has promised, you'll find rest for your soul. <laughs> that, that, that's what we want. He said in chapter 7, verse 23, walk ye in the ways I have commanded you that it may be well with you. Let's see how that's brought out in New Testament teaching. That should have reminded you of the Lord's statement in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your souls. The Lord promised you exactly that. Or, as Paul said in this passage that is very iconic, in Ephesians chapter 6, children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father, father and mother, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. So God has promised his people of old, his people today, the things that are blessing for us. Just a reminder, we do not want to be like the kingdom of Israel as we bring our lesson to a close. Because Jeremiah even quotes the, the, the kingdom, the, the people of Judah. They said, what did they say? Did they humble themselves and bow before God? No, they said, we will not. We will not. That's why they were led into captivity. That's why the kingdom was destroyed because they refused, but, but they're God's children. But God promised, and God told them that this would happen if they would not be faithful unto him. So extending the old paths into uh, the invitation, this is an old path question. It's asking Acts 16 and verse 31, what must I do to be saved? I couldn't think of a more important question for any of us to ask than this. What must I do? to save my soul? Well, the old path question has an old path answer, and that is as taught in these passages, expressed in the order in which they would naturally occur when obeyed, to believe in Christ, to repent of our sins, to confess our faith, and to be baptized for the remission of our sins. And I would suggest to you, just as every other part, well, there are people who deny that. There are people who have thrown that away. People have saying that's obsolete. We've got a new way. We would affirm again that even this question and its answer is not obsolete. It's the only one. It's a pressing need. So perhaps there's someone in this audience today that is desirous of responding to the gospel's invitation, to the invitation of the old path, uh, the, to the gospel of Christ, then we stand ready to help you. Anyone at home desiring to study further, uh, let us know uh, while together we stand and sing.